All right, what's up everybody? Welcome to Earth Science. So what we're gonna do, this is the correlation lab. We're going to take what we've been learning, let's pop over to these pictures, about geochronology, about relative aging, and expand it a bit. So here's a really basic sedimentary rock outcrop from uh, up near the Tug Hill Plateau somewhere, lower in the Tug Hill Plateau. If I were just to take you here and say, okay, look at these rocks, at the very least, at this point, and if you've been doing all the lessons here, and if you haven't, go back and go in order, please. Um, at the very least, I'd be hoping that you could tell me that, okay, the older of these rock layers is on bottom, and then they progressively get younger and younger and younger up towards the top. And this isn't that big. This is maybe a little bit taller than me. I know I should have a scale here or something, but not that, not that big of a section. So here's the problem. What about any rocks that might have been there that were higher than that? That are therefore even younger. What about any rocks below this that might be even older, but they're they're buried beneath the ground, and I can't blast away with more dynamite like they did here when they made this road cup. I can't figure out outside of this section where it fits in Earth's history timeline. Okay, this would be like getting Moby Dick uh, one page because this is a really tiny amount of rock relative to Earth's whole entire four and a half billion year history. So if I gave you one page out of Moby Dick and you read it, would you know the whole entire book? You wouldn't. You would have to figure out how to get the other pages. So like in a book, it's easy, right? You got page 274. You're going to look for page 275 and maybe page 273. You're going to look for what comes before it and what comes after it. So geologically, we can't do that here because that's all gone. Yeah, I could dig down there. That's going to get expensive. But what I could do is make some notes, see what's in this rock, and then go see if I can find it in other places. Higher up in the Tug Hill, here's another photo of a much larger section. This is a deep gorge up in the northeast section, um, not too far from the big windmills that are up there. Um, a lot of rock here. And again, older towards the bottom, younger towards the top still applies. But what if I could find some of this section over at this park, like down low? Then I could match those two. And then I've got myself a couple of sections, a couple of pages of, of, of the great book of, of Earth's history. And then keep on doing that. Keep driving around New York, looking for more rocks. This is, uh, what's it called? Pratt's Falls, down towards like Pompey-ish, Pompey, New York, somewhere around there. Um, outside of Jamesville, that's probably closer. Okay. Um, that capstone up there is pretty unique. And then you can there's softer shale layers beneath it. So you can study all these rocks. Now, we, you know, in this course, we don't get that deep into it. Um, but you could go and you could take notes on all of these. You can look for certain characteristics within the beds, certainly certain fossils that are big giveaways. And then you can start to match up from section to section to section across New York. If you find enough individual pages of the book and you tape them all together just right, you've done a correlation job to give you a more entire you know, entire large picture of Earth's history and what it's all about. So that's the premise of this lab. Now, usually people, you know, this one's not bad. Usually what I do is I give you uh, nine of these little slips of paper that represent exposures of rock at different locations. And there's a little key. We don't have to worry about it really, because I'm going to do it for you. But a shale, a limestone, a black shale, a lighter shale, some more limestone. It's all listed out. So if you were to, and there's nine of these. So if you were to drive around New York to nine spots, just like I kind of did with these pictures, would you be able to take all of these and say, okay, geez, I think this matches here. In fact, those two, I know do match. There's two that match together. Look at that. So now I know, okay, that stuff down here that, oh, this is hard to do on camera. The stuff down here I can see is older. The stuff up here is younger. And I've taken two individual sections and correlated them to make one larger section. That's the magic of correlation. I have a PowerPoint slide where maybe we consider, I've never been to any of these places, uh, unfortunately, but if you go to Grand Canyon, uh, you got a whole bunch of rock layers. But if you can match that with another place, Zion National Park at Grand Canyon, that's as high as it gets. That's as young as it gets. But correlate there, then over to Zion, you get that. And then correlate there and over to Bryce Canyon, you get that. And now you've got one longer stretch of Earth's history. That's how we've really, that's how relative dating is really powerful. That's what's given us a more complete version 
of how we understand Earth's history, especially the history of life. I mean, sedimentary rock layers are very, like, not just they literally look like pages of a book, but in a way they are, because as you flip back to older and older pages, it tells a story. If it's a sandstone, we know we can infer what the environment was like back then. If we can find certain animals, we can make inferences about the environment at the time that this rock formed. Where do you see sand today? That might eventually turn to sandstone. Where do you see limestones? And if we understand where limestone forms today, we can figure out the environment of the past. And then in that way, it very literally is like a book. A book of Earth's history, page by page by page by page, telling us what's going on. And now this correlation tool allows us to really expand that to make one big old book. All right. So that's the premise of the lab. Um, let's fill out the top here in Cami. If you haven't opened it yet, press pause and go open this. Um, read that quick if you want. This is the description of the rocks you're going to use, though you're not going to have to worry about it. I'm going to tape these together and label it and then switch to the little handheld camera to do this part of the lab. And um, yeah, it'll be great. But let's get this bit out of the way up here because there's uh, an important idea and I'd expect some questions to pop up on this about index fossils and what is an index fossil. So what it is is a specific species of fossil that acts as a bookmark in geological period, which is very handy to geologists. Once it's, these have been established, and this took many, many, many geologists working for many, many, many years and unraveling a whole lot of stuff. But once it's been established that this certain animal lived specifically during this geologic time period, that's great news for us because then if I go to some rock and I don't know where I am at all and I pull out and I find that that animal, that critter, I can say, boom, in my head, I know exactly how old this rock is now. And therefore, everything above that is younger. Everything below that is older. For example, and, and you've already done this, that's what these animals towards the bottom are, are specific types of index fossils. So the letter A, Leptocephala, if you find that in fact, let's do B because I've, I've found that on a field trip uh, just on the way to Watertown up there at that at that big creek with the exposed limestone. I forget the name of it, just north of Sandy Creek. Um, we found specimens of this guy right here, letter B, Cryptolithus. All right. So in that case, and of course, using reference materials, unless you want to go memorize all this, which I think, you know, we were supposed to in college and I, I probably did but it's not, it's not bouncing around the head anymore. On this reference table, you would go and you would say, okay, there's letter B. And we come over here to say that letter B rock is from the Ordovician. So it's like an instant. You find that animal, boom, that rock is Ordovician. That's what an index fossil does for you. Again, going with the analogy of a book that bookmarks it right at Ordovician age. Another thing that I used to have memorized and has since left. It's got to be between 488 and 444 million years old. Okay. Now there's certain things though that must, an index fossil, there's certain properties that that animal must have. All right. And the one, and I, I kind of think if you really get what an index fossil is, this one's the most intuitive. It must have a short life history. Some species are very evolutionarily successful. They're species that live for a really, 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 really long time. And that's not us. We've only been here for a very short time geologically. But some animals manage to evolve, kind of, you know, establish themselves, and then stay steady for a really long time. That would not make a good index fossil. What I want when I find that cryptolithus is to know that cryptolithus only lived during the Ordovician. It evolved then and went extinct then. Other trilobites lived longer than that. They were born before and lived after. But that specific species of trilobite, might be a genus, whatever it is, um, only lived during the Ordovician. So I find it and I got Ordovician rock. That's a short life history. If it lived a long time, I'd pick it up. I wouldn't know. Is it Ordovician? Is it Devonian? What is it? What's the deal? So that is, uh, that's really critical for it. Index fossils must be geographically widespread. This would be an animal that's successful in that way, where it really can manage to live in a, in, a, in a large geographic area that's spread out. If you've ever heard of any animals that like 
this animal only lives in this spot. They're, oddly enough, at Chittenango Falls State Park, which is a nice place if you're ever out adventuring, there's a species of snail that only lives at the base of Chittenango State Falls State Park. It's the only place on the whole entire planet it lives. So that would not make a good index fossil. We want to be able to find this thing. I mean, we geology students found that cryptolithus at that creek up the, up the road, up 81 a little bit there, or up Route 3 a little bit. Um, and it's in lots of places, making it useful so that you can find it in lots of places and always have it serve as that bookmark. It can't be really rare. I think the third one... Oh, no, 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 